We are back. Another week of Avalanche Mailbag here. You guys just came in so heavy with the questions last week. We had to split last week's mailbag into two. Uh, and we got another one coming for you guys next week. So keep those off-season questions coming all summer long. I love digging into them, giving you guys uh, the answers to your questions to the best of my ability, right? We're going to start here with two from a very loyal follower, Mary. Uh, back-to-back questions from her. Let's get into it. Your best guess is the front office handcuffed enough by the Landeskog and the Chushkin contract situations that we should be expecting a boring or low event offseason. Short answer, yes. Uh, I, I think that with the upcoming Miko Rantanen extension, the uncertainty around when Gabe Landeskog will be back, and I guess not even necessarily the uncertainty around when he'll be back, it's really more of anticipating that he'll likely be back at some point in the regular season. So you need to leave that money earmarked. And then Val Nachushkin, there is just so much uncertainty there. Unless the Abs can find a way to get some amount of clarity with Val Nachushkin, whether he's coming back or not, that would maybe change things. But for the most part, I think we're looking at a couple guys they might try to re-sign. And then, yeah, you're filling in around the fringes if you can even dip into the uh, you know free agent market. Here's one thing that I want everyone out there to keep in mind. It was something that was told to me a few years ago, kind of as a joke, but it has stuck with me because it's so true. Your roster doesn't have to be finalized before training camp. You have all the way until the trade deadline in February to make the roster look the way you want it to look. I expect the Avs to do that as they get increasing clarity on Valanchushkin and Gabe Landeskog as the season unfolds. But Getting a little bit of help with the salary cap going up. For the most part, though, I think the Avs are going to keep this one quiet, keep it kind of boring uh, in the offseason with just a little bit of uncertainty that's, that's going around the organization right now. Second question from Mary here. Quick question on strategy. Do you think the Avs change up uh, anything, systems, or personnel to try to keep up with Dallas? Systems, strategy? No. The Avs have had sustained success that they've had under Jared Bednar because they play their style of game. They stick to their process, whatever cliche you want to use. That's something that, that is ingrained in the DNA in this group. So they're not going to change the way they play. The last two playoffs that the Avs have been eliminated against the Dallas Stars and the Seattle Kraken, the theme has been depth, depth, depth. That is the one part I think the Avs will continue to try to address. They addressed it this year. I thought they had a deep team. You lose Val Nichushkin, you lose Jonathan Druin, you lose Logan O'Connor. Uh, you know, it, it, it jumbles things up. The Avs are going to be looking to bolster that depth throughout the season next year. Uh, so that's maybe the one thing. Yes, you could say some personnel changes. Systematically, no, the Avs aren't going to change a thing. What are your personal opinions on how the refs were calling games during the playoffs? Do you think we should start having them available for press conferences after each game playoffs or regular season? First part of the question... I didn't have any issue uh, really with the officiating when the abs were on the run and continuing to watch the playoffs now, don't have any issue with how the, the game is being officiated. We know there's always a little bit, a couple extra liberties um, allowed in the playoffs. Rule book is stretched a little bit further, but for the most part, no, I haven't had an issue with it. We've come to expect this. It's the playoffs. It's a little bit more rough and tumble. If you followed me now for the last couple of years, you know that the second part of this question is one thing I'm very passionate about. Yes, I absolutely think officials should have to come out and talk to the media after. Not every official, but I do think there should be one lead official designated every night, and they go out after and just answer questions to the media if requested. On most nights, media probably wouldn't even want to talk to the officials. But every now and then, we have a call or a non-call that is you know, very polarizing, has a big impact on the outcome of the game. Uh, and, and it would just be nice to get some of those explanations. You know, sometimes we talk to head coaches after the game and say, what was the explanation you were given? And they really aren't given one until later when they contact the league and can kind of get a private answer. I just think that it doesn't hurt anybody. You know, no one in the media is going to be there to try to get the refs. You know, if you, you're not really in media if you're out there trying to get anybody during a presser, right? Or at least you shouldn't be. And, and, so I don't think there's any issue with bringing an official out and saying, what did you see? Why did you make that call? Why didn't you make that call? Or even better, on goal reviews, goaltender interference, offsides, especially ones that, again, are, are close, borderline, up to, you know, kind of a judgment call. It would just be great to get the explanation of what did you see? Can you walk us through that? 
I don't think it's unfair to ask a ref, can you walk us through that? Given that we ask players all the time, can you walk us through that mistake? Can you walk us through that play? I, I think it helps the refs. It helps the league give more clarity. And it helps everyone else get the answers that they wanted. So, yes, I absolutely think regular season or playoffs, if an official is requested by media, there should be one lead official that goes out and answers questions. What do you think Georgiev's workload will be next season now that Ananen is backing up full time? And how many starts do you see Ananen getting? It's going to be a smaller workload next year than it was this year. No doubt about it. Georgiev likes to be in a rhythm, likes to play a lot of games. It was too many games this season. The Avs, there was too many question marks uh, at the backup goaltender position. I think they have, they feel confident internally. Eustace Annan is ready to take the next step, and that's being a full-time NHL backup. You have to keep in mind, Alexander Georgiev's contract is up after this year. I think it'd be crazy to assume that they're not going to try to see maybe what they have in Yusuf Sandin after the way that he finished the season this year. I would expect him to get 20, anywhere from 20 to 30 games for Yusuf Sandin, uh, I think is going to be somewhere that the Abs want him to, to, to live. Again, you have to keep in mind, Alexander Yuryev likes to play a lot of games, so they're still going to let him do that. But if Yusuf Sandin really starts to push, they might turn their attention to all right, well, is maybe this guy our answer? Do we go to more of a 1A, 1B situation? Is, is Yusuf Sandin in the answer beyond this season? I think there's going to be uh, an interesting goaltender competition in net this year for the Avs, and that's led by the fact that I think Yusuf Sandin is starting to push a little bit here for full-time NHL minutes. So uh, we'll see if he can get there. We'll see if he can continue to take steps. Uh, but I definitely think the workload for Georgiev will be down this year. More games for Annanen, assuming he continues to trend in the direction that he was trending when the season ended. I could see the Avs bringing back one of Duhame or Trennan, which do you think is most likely? Look, I, I want to say Yakov Trennan. I saw a salary projection for him a couple days ago that I thought was way too high. And if that's what the salary projection is, right around $3.5 the Avs won't be able to bring him back. Uh, I think Yakov Trennan fit really well with what this group likes to do. He's a Jared Bednar type guy. Uh, and that's someone who I think could be a set and forget 4C. Uh, you could run uh, McKinnon, Middlestat. Colton and Trennan down the middle, and I think you're feeling great about that. Duhame, I liked him, but he's really more of a 13th forward uh, for a group like this, really pushing for a Stanley Cup. If they brought him back, I would have no issues with that. But I do think that it would be uh, Yakov Trennan uh, that the Avs would try to bring back. We'll see if the money works, though. Bednar is careful how slash when he calls out players of the team and almost never loses composure. Does that hold in practice, the locker room, etc.? Does his public persona completely match his private? Look, obviously, we don't. I, I don't get to hang out with Jared Bednar all the time. I've gotten to know Jared a little bit over the last couple years, had some great conversations with him, uh, you know, a, a, away from the podium. One, he, he, he's a great guy. His, his persona, I think, does kind of match. Now, I think he's a much more passionate guy than maybe what he leads on on the bench. And we've had players tell us before, Nazem Kadri and Kel McCarr a couple years ago at the All-Star Game, that, oh, no, when he needs to get after us, he has no problem raising his voice. He's a much more passionate guy than what you would believe just by watching him, uh, you know, on the bench. Uh, but he does truly believe that that kind of calm composure is what it takes to be successful in the NHL. You can't ride the emotions. You can't ride the ups and downs. And when the players are starting to do it, he's got to be the calming influence to say, we're not going to, we're not going to take the roller coaster ride today. So I do think that there's a lot of people that think, the calm persona, they, they maybe mistake that for not caring or not being engaged. But really, it, it's, it's strategic for him. I can't fly off the handle here because I'm the leader of this group. And if they see me go crazy, they're going to go crazy. And that doesn't help anybody. So the calm, cool, collected uh, composure that you see from him behind the bench, while that is a defining uh, trait of his coaching style, I would not say that that matches completely who Jared Bednar is away from the ice. So a uh, little bit of difference there. C-Mac talked about cheap contract types of guys. Who in the system can you honestly see taking a roster spot next season at a low cap and can be effective for the Avs? There's two in particular uh, that I would actually go as far to say I will be surprised if they aren't on the roster next year. And I do have 
uh, expectations that they can both contribute based on stuff that we saw this year. One is the obvious Nikolai Kovalenko coming over from the KHL, kind of a long-anticipated uh, arrival. I do believe he would have had a bigger role in the playoffs had it not been for the injury that he got on his last shift in the KHL. Came over, had to kind of just jump straight into the rehab, wasn't able to get in games for the playoffs. The Avs got him a couple playoff games, and he was good. He was passable. He was fine. Made one bad mistake that Jerry Bednar said that he addressed with him right away. Uh, I expect Kovalenko to be a guy that is on the roster next year and a contributor to some extent. The other is Sam Malinsky. Sam Malinsky got several looks with the Avs this year and really kind of forced their hand to keep him in the lineup at times. I thought he was outstanding throughout the season, continued to get better, was able to get in a, a, a lot of games with the Eagles, got in some playoff games, and then he got to be around the abs as a black ace uh, through their first two rounds of the playoffs. So a lot of valuable experience for him. I look at a guy like Sean Walker, who's probably departing, likely won't be back next year. Sam Malinsky seems like the perfect candidate to just slide into that spot right there, start his full-time NHL career. And again, I've said it multiple times this year. I do believe the emergence of Sam Malinsky is why the Az were comfortable moving on from Bowen Byram uh, when they did. So those are the two guys that I think no question should be in the lineup next year. Maybe look at a guy like Jean-Luc Foody too, depending on what kind of camp he has, starting to push for that. Uh, Riley Tufty, another option. And Oscar Olausen, will we see him take that step? There's five guys that I think could be in the mix with two of them feeling pretty confident we'll be there coming out of training camp. All right, last question here, and this is one that we hear a lot. I've actually put together a list. Why are the Avs struggling to draft and develop young talent? I get the sentiment. I get it. I get it, folks. You know, you, you look at a team like the Dallas Stars, uh, you got Logan Stankoven, uh, and, and you got, you know, Wyatt Johnston, Jason Robertson, absolutely, no doubt. You know, it's tough to say, hey, why aren't the Avs doing that? I would argue that they have and that they did. Uh, I just got a list here. So here's five players that I expect to be on the roster next year that are drafted, developed by the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, Nathan McKinnon, pretty good player. Miko Rantanen, pretty good player. Kale McCarr, pretty good player. Uh, Nikolai Kovalenko, and I know what you're going to say. He was in the KHL. You're crazy if you think that the Avs don't have a hand in developing those players. I just named Kale McCarr. The Avs were very involved with his development at UMass. Last but not least, Yusis Anandan. This is a guy that they have been very high on since they took him in the third round uh, back in 2017. And they have worked with step by step by step to the point where you're now feeling like you potentially have an NHL goaltender in your system. So there's five guys right there that are going to be uh, on a 20-man roster next year pretty good percentage um, of players at the abs drafted and we've now seen develop into NHL players. Here's three more players um, that haven't yet. Well, there's varying reasons. I got Sean Barron's on here. That is an avalanche draft pick. We're expecting him to make the step next year. Logan O'Connor, not a draft pick, but an unsigned college free agent came in as an invite at uh, development camp, worked his way through the American League and is now a bona fide, no questions asked full-time NHLer. Very impactful on a Stanley Cup roster. Another guy that I just mentioned in the last question, Sam Malinsky, undrafted free agent. The Avs have brought in and over the course of a season and a half have developed him into a guy that I'm expecting to take a full-time roster spot in the NHL next year. Three more players that you could make an argument for, and I know these are a little bit of a stretch. One, Sam Girard came in as a young player, only a couple of NHL games under his belt, and the Avs would develop him into a solid top four defenseman, no questions asked. I thought he was outstanding this season in particular. That's a guy the Avs have overseen basically the entire development process with. Uh, Arturi Lekkinen, yes, when he came here, everyone knew analytically this was a solid player, but the leap that he has taken playing in the Avalanche organization under Jared Bednar is not something that I think anybody expected. That's another player that you could easily make the argument the Avs have developed into just a different caliber of NHL player. And the last one I've got here, and I know, I know we don't want to talk about it right now, and we're not going to get too far into it, but it is Val Nachushkin. This was a guy who was cast off to the KHL, no goals in over 82 games, uh, just over 90 games even, more than a full season, and the Avs had developed him back into one of the best wingers in the league. 
We're not going to go anything beyond that. We all know what's going on with Val Nichushkin. But there's 11 guys that I can point to on this current roster. That's more than half that I would say the Avs have either drafted and developed or had a significant hand in their development from the time they were young players into the players they are now. It's hard to draft. And it's even harder to draft when you get out of the first round. I don't have the numbers pulled up in front of me. Jay was too efficient this morning. We got recording too quickly. I didn't have time. The percentage of players that make it to become full-time NHLers beyond the first round is low. You have to work very hard to get those players churned out into the NHL. The Avs have done a good job, not to mention what they've been able to do with someone like Bowen Byram, drafted, developed, flipped for an asset. Uh, Alex Newhook, drafted, developed, flipped for an asset. There's examples of it all over the place. You just got to be willing to look for them. Yes, you would love for every single player that the Avs pick in the draft to develop and be turned into a full-time NHLer. That's just not the reality. I just ran through, like I said, 11 guys that I expect to be on the roster for next year. That's more than half your lineup uh, that I would credit the Avs with their development. So, not bad there. That's it, guys. That's all we got from the mailbag this week. Keep the questions coming. We'll put out another call for it uh, at the beginning of next week. But you guys are great as always. Thanks so much. Keep the questions coming.